I am a uh, special events director with the UCLA Student Alumni Association. And a little bit about what we do is we're a 100 member student organization that puts on different events and programs and things like that to try to bring together all aspects of the Bruin community. So students, staff, faculty, alumni, we're trying to get them all together. Um, so this is just one way we do different types of networking nights to bring together students and alumni. And this is one of them. And we're really, really happy and proud to be bringing that to you tonight. So we are also going to introduce the rest of us. So I, like I said, my name is Aiden. Uh, I'm Carly. I am also <laughs> in SAA. And Aiden, Laura, and I are all specialized programming directors with uh, SAA. And we're really excited to be hosting this event with you guys in collaboration with Dash Design. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura. Um, as Aiden and Carly mentioned, we're the specialized programming directors. Um, and I'm also an international student, and so we definitely found a need for this event, and we're so excited to be sharing this with all of you um, and sharing our amazing alumni and their experiences. Hi, everyone. I'm Kat. Um, I'm a student staff for the DASHU Center. Um, if you don't know already, the DASHU Center is the International Center, and in addition to things like visa questions, um, and other general administrative things. We also do programming like this one. And uh, we also have programs and leadership opportunities. For example, we are collaborating, collaborating with SAA through our um, professional development committee in our international student ambassador program. One of our ambassadors is actually joining us and he'll introduce himself soon. But while you're all here, I just wanted to let you know that for our next year's cohort of ambassadors, the application is actually live right now. And so if you're interested in getting an opportunity to help with cool events like this, uh, feel free to apply. I'll put the link to that in the chat and introduce and let Pietro, our ambassador, introduce himself. So hi, everyone. My name is Pietro. I am originally, I was actually born in Brazil, but I'm partially from Argentina and I'm part of the ambassador program. By the way, I recommend all of you interested in becoming an ambassador to apply. You get to meet amazing people. You get to be part of amazing programs. And I also wanted to mention one of the programs that we've been doing in the ambassador uh, program, which is called the Globus Project, where we basically interview accomplished alumni and we post on Notion, I think that's the name of the website. So I really recommend you guys checking it out. Thank you everyone for coming and it's really a pleasure to be here. So this is a little bit of an overview of the event. So we're in our welcome stage right now. And then from 6, 6 10 to 7 p.m. There's gonna be a question and answer panel with all of our alumni. Uh, we took questions from the Google Forms that you guys or that all the students submitted to us. Um, and we're gonna try to incorporate some of those questions in. If you have um, spare questions that you wanna ask the alumni, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll get to them if we have time. If not, of course, save them for the networking period when you have more of a um, direct contact with the alumni so we, you can get those questions answered then. So with that, I think we're gonna get started. Cool, so I guess we'll get started. Um, I'll be your MC tonight. Um, I just want to say welcome to all of our alumni. Thank you so much for joining all of us. We're really excited to have you here and to learn from all of your experiences going to UCLA and getting jobs and working abroad. Um, so to start, why don't we start with you guys introducing yourselves. I'm sure everyone's really curious about who's here. Um, what if we, why don't we start with Yifei? Hi everybody. My name's Yifei. Um, studied economics at UCLA. Um, graduated in 2016. Um, so I'm located in Canada and I currently work as an investment analyst at a small VC fund called uh, Low Green Bamboo Capital. Um, feel free to talk to me about anything related to finding jobs in finance. Um, I recruited for everything from accounting to consulting to banking to everything you can name it and I have a bit of uh, experience in it. So feel free to reach out. Uh, next, would Christy like to introduce herself? Sure, I'd love to. Hi guys, um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Christy, I'm currently a marketing professional. Uh, I specialize in digital marketing, brand management and CRM. Uh, right now, I work at BlackRock and as a management firm um, as vice president of their digital marketing in APAC. 
Um, I, I, I stationed in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm born and raised in Hong Kong too. I'm an international student. I won't tell you guys when I graduated, but it was well back. Um, I, um, before uh, uh, working at BlackRock, I was actually in the beauty industry. So I worked for Estee Lauder and L'Oreal for quite some time serving brands like Tom Ford, Estee Lauder, uh, YSL, um, and so on and so forth, uh, held roles spanning you know, product, man product management, uh, 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 brand communications, e-commerce, and all that fun stuff. Um, I, did, I majored in uh, communication studies when I was still at UCLA, uh, was very active in you know, student societies um, like the, the Undergraduate Communication Association, um, the Hong Kong Student Society, and um, I, I'm very happy to be here to share my experiences as well as um, I've received a lot of great uh, mentorship over the years and I would love to kind of pay it forward. So if you guys need anything, um, any advice, uh, especially around the marketing field, I'm, um, I'm happy to talk to you guys. Awesome. It's great to have you here, Christy. Uh, next, um, would Mai Tan like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, Hi, everyone. My name is Mai Tan. Um, I studied English at UCLA, class of 2008. I'm currently working as a counselor within an international school in Hong Kong. I also lecture part-time at HKU Space on positive psychology. Um, let's see. I am not from Hong Kong. I'm born and raised in San Gabriel, California, not that far from UCLA. I'm so happy to be here to talk about um, being a domestic student working abroad after graduation. And uh, look forward to talking to all of you. Awesome. Up next, we have George. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. George Radix. I'm a senior lecturer at the National University of Singapore. Um, I, um, uh, I've been here for about seven years. I actually did my graduate work in Singapore as well. So if you have questions about uh, pursuing uh, academia or studying outside of the U.S. after you graduate. Uh, I'm definitely here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. It's great to have you. Um, next we have Tommy. Hi, um, this is Tommy from Hong Kong. Um, I had economics and math, mathematics back in um, to the, um, graduating in 2008, um, kind of like in the in, uh, in the financial tsunami, but then um, the good thing is um, I was in the finance industry and then I went off to um, to Europe for my PhD. I quit my PhD for, for an education technology startup. Right now my project is um, based in Hong Kong. Um, have, we, we have branch office in Melbourne, London, Tokyo as well. So, um, because of the COVID, I'm mainly in Hong Kong this year, unless I, I have to be necessary flying out. So feel free to, um, to, um, to ask me questions about education, technology, or stuff in, in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have Jubing. Hi, everyone. My name is Jubing. I double majored in global studies and economics from 2014 to 2018. I was born and raised in China, came to the United States at the age of 18 to attend college. After graduation, I went to the University of Chicago to study public policy. I got a master's degree in public policy. At the same time, I worked for United Nations Capital One Fund. And after graduation from U Chicago, I currently work at RMI. RMI is a nonprofit organization dedicated to research and consulting in the field of sustainability or clean energy. And I'm with the urban transformation team at RMI. My job is to provide one-on-one -on -one consulting services to American cities and counties to achieve their climate goals. Excellent, great to have you, Jubing. Up next, we have Stanley. Hey, everyone. Uh, this is Stanley Chan, um, and like Christy, I'm going to sort of hold back on when I graduated. It's a long back. I think I'm the oldest probably, uh, alumni on the panel here. Um, I majored in electrical engineering and then uh, I went off and got my MBA from, from Haas Berkeley. Uh, predominantly worked in Silicon Valley and technology companies and then moved over to Singapore, where I'm at now for the past five years. Uh, currently work for Amazon. 
uh, so happy to answer any questions about folks interested in working in tech and startups, uh, the role that I'm in, have the pleasure of uh, engaging and working with startups to large technology companies. Um, so again, happy to talk to anyone who's interested in this field, either pursuing startups or maybe even uh, working overseas in this space. Thanks again. Thank you. And up next we have Sergio. Hi, um, I'm Sergio Morita. I'm in Japan. I graduated in 1992. So I think that makes me the oldest. Uh, I, I think I beat Stanley because if he's embarrassed to say when he was, when he graduated, he's probably a lot younger. Um, you get older, you, you know, lose a lot of embarrassment. So I work in Japan. Uh, I worked in lived and worked in Japan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Uh, my whole career was in banking, uh, investment banking. I've left banking a, a couple of years ago, and I have been doing outside of a bank what I used to do at a bank, which is arrange private financings uh, and sometimes equity investments. Um, I focus on distress and high yield. Um, what else I say? I'm, I am not. I'm Japanese. Uh, but I spend half my time in Hong Kong. I'm a resident there and half of my time in Japan, well, until COVID happened. But I was born and raised in Brazil. So that's me. Awesome. And last, I believe we have Kauri. Yes. Hi, do you hear me okay now? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I am. I'm originally from Japan and I went to graduate school, Asian American Studies. And after that, I worked in the Hollywood entertainment industry after, after working as a journalist. And then I had to come back for a family reason. And so here I am helping with the uh, journalists club in Tokyo. And that's me. Uh, let, ask me any question regarding uh, Hollywood entertainment industry between Japan and the US. Thank you so much. So we clearly have an extremely accomplished group here with us. We're so thankful to have you guys and all your wisdom here as some of us prepare to graduate, as we're like approaching, just trying to get jobs, trying to prepare to be able to apply for jobs. Um, yeah. And so I believe we would like to know more. And so we'll get started with our Q and A. And I think I'm gonna start by asking Tommy, um, as the founder and CEO of a company, how did you connect with people and network around the world to grow it to the scale that it's at now? Oh, oh thank you for the questions. Um, I would say um, it's tough, it's tough. Um, I still remember that when I, when I returned from, um, uh, from Europe, uh, when, I, when I quit my PhD for, 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 um, for the for startup in Hong Kong, I, I knew no people, but then, um, so um, I had to kind of, I had to grow my team, but then when you grow your team is, it's actually, uh, it takes quite a lot of um, like energy to convince people to quit their job, to join your team as well, right? So I would say one of the key is you, it's, it could be really cliche, but then it's it's actually really true that you need to have a vision in what you do in case you want to do a startup because um, the vision will overcome the ups and downs. So um, there will be time that when, when your valuation is super high, but then there will be times that when your sales suddenly in one or two quarter, it drops a lot. So um, you need a really good vis vision, conviction to stay um, to stay calm during the bad days. And then the people, once they, they kind of feel your vision, then they will stay with you. So um, the good thing is our retention in the project is really high. Um, they're even like fresh graduates. Uh, when they graduate from college, they stay with us for more than seven years now. Um, and for the seven years, they grew from a, like really from a management trainee now to almost like a country manager um, in Melbourne, in Tokyo as well. So I guess it's, um, it's more like you have a vision and then um, and, and communication with the people. So it's, it's kind of my tips for building um, people management in the startup world. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, our next question will be for George. 
So coming from a primarily academic or research-based background, how do you, what advice would you give for finding jobs and internships? And also, is there any difference that you found in applying to PhD programs abroad as opposed to in the US? Uh, I think that's a, a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, thanks, Kat. I, I think um, uh, in terms of applying for internships and, uh, and jobs as a fresh grad with a degree in the social sciences, I think you have a lot of um, a lot of opportunities. You can go in many different directions. As soon as you start to specialize and focus and go to grad school, then you have to really decide if academia is the right direction for you. Um, and I, I, I don't want to say there, there are no regrets. I don't want to say that I regret going to graduate school outside of the US. I think that there are a lot of strengths um, if you decide to do a master's degree outside of the US and then go back to the US for your PhD. Um, but if you decide to do your PhD abroad, it is a little bit more difficult to return to the US to, to become an academic uh, because the academic market is so competitive and it's very well networked. So wherever you decide to go to graduate school uh, to become a, an academic afterwards, um, those networks are gonna be really important. Now, um, here at NUS, the National University of Singapore, most of the professors here have degrees from the United States, which makes it, um, which shows you where, where the valuable degrees are from. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily make it easier for you to kind of um, uh, go back to to the U.S. Uh, to a to an academic institution there. Um, but I, I think, uh, given that we're living in a, in a globalized world and that academia needs to become less Euro American centric, I think that there is definitely value in having some training. Um, in different parts of the world so that you can uh, learn a, a, a new perspective and see questions and problems from a different angle. And wherever you end up, you can always share that knowledge and experience. Um, but like I said, if you decide to go down the academic route, um, it, it, you really have to focus on where you want to end up and decide to go to school in, in that um, in, in that country. Um, I, one other thing I will add is that the, initially I, I went to grad school just for the master's degree and then it snowballed into a PhD. And then afterwards I decided to go to law school uh, because I thought that this was gonna be a more um, practical degree. And uh, I eventually realized that I liked doing research and writing uh, so I ended up back in academia, but, uh, you know, law school is very similar in that regard where, um, there are certain top law schools that you go to that if you go to these schools, then it'll be easy for you to find jobs in the legal market anywhere. Uh, if you decide to go to a school, uh, that's not in the top 10 per se, then you really have to decide which jurisdiction you want to practice in and, and then go to the school uh, there. Um, but I guess well, the, the last thing I will say is that um, regardless of what, what you choose, your UCLA degree will take you very far. Everywhere I've gone, people have recognized my degree. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a brand that, uh, that opens doors um, and it says that you're a quality candidate regardless of where you end up. And whatever part of the world you end up in, um, it's it's something to be proud of. Thank you so much for that, George. That's really comforting to hear <laughs> as um, somebody who's going to graduate soon. Um, would you mind reminding us of what you teach? Maybe talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, I teach in the sociology department. And because of my training in sociology, and in the law, I teach a lot of the deviance classes, uh, the, the crime classes, the sociology of crime, 
uh, sociology of human rights um, and yeah, and social theory and introduction to sociology, the classes that they require all professors to teach. Um, so, yeah. That's great, thank you. My next question is for my Tan. So as somebody who's originally from Los Angeles, what things do you wish you had known when you decided to work abroad? And what was the catalyst for choosing to work abroad? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> uh, I can say for sure, you never, well, I have never stopped missing uh, real Mexican food and In-N-Out. Just sometimes I just want an In-N-Out burger. Um, but all of that aside, I was very lucky. So when I was at UCLA, I did the EAP program. I studied abroad. I was very lazy. So I only looked at programs where you didn't have to take a language requirement. That left me Hong Kong, Singapore, or Australia. And then I was like, yeah, Hong Kong, why not? Um, so when I was when I graduated from UCLA, I worked at a few different nonprofits. I was in San Francisco for a while doing my master's. And when I started applying for jobs, um, I don't know, it just on a whim, I was like, you know what? I always loved Hong Kong. I know what it's about. It's safe, it's English speaking. Um, why don't I give it a go? And I honestly can say it's my seventh year in Hong Kong. I always try to convince my friends who I grew up with that they should move to Hong Kong. Nobody has taken me up on that offer yet. But I will say, um, if you're looking at going into teaching, education, counseling, mental health, psychology, um, there is such a big demand in Hong Kong right now. So as working within a school, I refer students to outside professionals all the time, and they always have a long wait list. There is just, um, I think, parts of Hong Kong is really waking up to you know what mental health is and what mental well um, wellness is, and um, there just isn't enough psychologists and counselors uh, to see these, these adolescents and see these adults. Um, so I would say the one thing I definitely didn't know was how valued I would be um, coming from UCLA, native English speaker, coming to Hong Kong, and the number of opportunities that I have had uh, while living in Hong Kong. So I would say definitely probably not coming back anytime soon. So if anyone has any questions about living in Hong Kong, living in Asia, um, I would love to answer it because I, San Gabriel is a small town. I didn't grow up thinking I would ever end up where I am now. Um, so I would love to you know, elaborate if anyone has any questions later. Thank you. Um, on the other side of that, uh, Christy, you actually returned to your home country after graduation. What barriers were there for you in terms of networking, job opportunities, things like that after being in LA for four years? Thank you for the question. Yes, um, uh, I, uh, I, I was born and raised in Hong Kong. And then after you know, my, doing my bachelor's degree in UCLA, I, I returned to Hong Kong. Um, I think in terms of barriers, in terms of networking and internship opportunities or work opportunities, I don't feel as, I don't see as much hurdle that you would imagine because I think um, every summer I try to kind of build, um, I, I return to my hometown to build my network there. Um, I think at the time um, I, I tried interning uh, both in the States and also in Hong Kong. So in the summer I returned to Hong Kong to kind of build my network there. Um, I was Act, uh, at the time, I was very active in the uh, UCLA Alumni Association in Hong Kong. I, ma I made a lot of great friends there. Uh, I'm also in a couple of networks. For example, um, uh, at the time, I was uh, uh, helping out with you know women in tech, and then um, now I'm also in Women in Finance Asia. So these networks actually help you meet you know professionals at the time, and also uh, uh, also uh, mingle with peers. Uh, 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 just to meet different people. So that's why I think in Hong Kong, I always used my summers really well. And uh, I interned every summer in Hong Kong. And then during the year, I interned in the States. So fall quarter, spring quarter, um, I, 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 I was lucky enough to score internships um, in, in, in LA. So I got, you know, I got an experience to work at a, a Hollywood studio uh, and, and a marketing agency in LA. And then back in Hong Kong, I actually tried, you know, being a journalist and then I interned for Estee Lauder as well. That was where I got my return offer. So I think in terms of 
barriers. Um, I, I think like time was, um, time and location was difficult during the year, but I did plan out my, uh, my, my academic career around uh, when I get to kind of um, uh, return to my hometown and versus, you know, during the year I can, you know, I, I try to take, you know, Tuesday, Thursday classes so that my Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays are off so that I can do it so that I can take internships. So I think it's all about, you know, planning your time well, and then um, uh, make good use of networks that's available for you through UCLA or not, um, or outside of UCLA. And I think um, the ability to, um, to network with alumni is a great one. So it's a great way to kind of talk to you guys later. Uh, alumni is a great resource. The other will be, you know, I also was part of a couple of student societies. So there are international students there as well. So you get to kind of network with them. And I think another thing will be be pro as proactive as possible, not just um, when you're supposed to be networking, but during, you know, at, when during, you know, your off time, um, when you're on LinkedIn, uh, connect with people, talk to people, and then keep your networks and keep your relationships warm. And um, even after you finish an internship, do keep the relationship warm with your either supervisor or your team. You never know like when an opportunity will pop up, when people will think of, think of you. And obviously to, um, uh, to, 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 to work really diligently so that people know what you're capable of, what, if you're willing to learn and if they're willing to give you an opportunity. So those are the advice that I have. And I'm, um, I'm happy to kind of speak to you all after as well uh, in terms of my career experience, my intern experience and how that led to, um, led to all the opportunities that I had. Thank you, Christy. That's great news to hear. Uh, shout out to everyone who's at our panel today. You guys are already on the right track, apparently. <laughs> um, my next question is for Kauri. So you're someone who lives in Japan and you have your work ties in with the entertainment industry, especially Hollywood. So speaking of connections, how do you make and maintain connections with people in the United States? And how do you recommend Bruins to make international connections? Well, actually, um, after coming back to Japan, um, it, it's kind of hard to keep in touch with the people uh, with my work because uh, people move around a lot, uh, really fast in Hollywood. So like in several years, people you know change jobs or retire early or move to any, some, somewhere else, even though they're really well-known people um, sometime. So, um, but um, I, after coming back to Japan, I am helping out with alumni here, local alumni, and um, trying to keep in touch with uh, um, people through um, their source of uh, um, messaging and, and things like that. So, um, but uh, um, we also always have new people coming. So um, it, it's always very important to, to look after young people and because they will be the next uh, um, producer in uh, things like that. Um, I don't know if I asked, answered the question well. What else was that? Um, I don't think so. Uh, do you have any recommendations for Bruins making international connections? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely recommend young people to always uh, um, try whatever you really want to try, um, like during school. Um, like it really helped me uh, to land in my job uh, after I, I was working extensively at TV stations in uh, uh, magazine uh, publishers in Japan while I was a student. Um, I, I, I graduated from Japanese University, Waseda, and then I went to grad school in, in LA, well, UCLA. But that, that really, uh, my experience in undergrad really helped me out in even doing research at Asian American Studies I did. And even after my graduation, um, you know, all, the, all the things I learned at UCLA really helped me in Hollywood also, uh, the research skill, um, um, like negotiation skill, especially 
all, everything, like discussion skills that really helped me. Um, you know, I also had to interpret also during the um, negotiations. So I also took a uh, um, California Court Certified Interpreter exam, and, and which is really, uh, not many people pass that exam. Well, well my English skill really felt ap apart after coming back to Japan, but, but back then I was pretty good. <laughs> And uh, I was promoted to be the um, the president of the um, American operation of a major ad agency later, but I, I declined because uh, I was required not to get married and things. Um, you know, it's, that's really Japanese cultural thing. But as a woman, you have to give up a lot. You're expected to give up a lot of personal things in which I wasn't happy with. Um, but on the on the other side, when working in Hollywood um, with American side, it was really great because I didn't have to worry about anything of being a woman or anything about coming from Japan. Um, so it was really a wonderful experience. I didn't want it to come back to Japan honestly as a, as a Japanese woman, but you know I was required to come back due to family reasons. So so sometimes you don't have a choice. But then Japan is gradually changing. And I, I, I think in terms of women's situation, right now in Japan, it's like America's 1970s. So finally women started to make us uh, be more assertive, asking for their rights and things. So this, I hope I'm seeing some hope here. We will see. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Kaori. Um, on the topic of cultural differences, my next question is for Sergio. So you've worked in diverse markets around the world, like Japan, Australia, and Singapore. What are some of the main cross-cultural di cultural differences that have affected your work experience? And how would you advise a graduating Bruin on how to navigate those? So the main cross-cultural differences that affected my work, did I get it right? Yes. Um, you know, this is actually something that I, I deal with on a daily basis and I struggle with sometimes. Um, because, you see, I work in, I, I've been based in Japan and for the past 12 years, I split my time, about half the month in Hong Kong, half, half the time in Japan. But I remain a, a Hong Kong resident. So I spend less than 182 days in Japan. Um, but I've also done similar, uh, I've lived in Singapore as well, uh, so I was based in Singapore, I've lived there. And um, one of the things is, I, having gone to, the, to school in the US, you know, I've, um, and some of the classes I, I took, you know, I, looking at the US from outside when I was at UCLA, America, uh, or an American, America is at the center of the world. You know, if you look at movies, Hollywood movies um, are a lot more common than European movies. I love French movies too, but there aren't that many, you know, and they kind of like end a little more uh, tragically than American movies. So, you know, every, everybody thinks, uh, I think I, when I came to Asia, I didn't realize that my thinking had become so molded by the American uh, thinking. And so one of the things that uh, I first had, I came to Japan and back then I was not a speaker of Japanese. I grew up speaking Portuguese, uh, a little bit of French. And so, you know, I'd go somewhere and just think that, you know, I could speak English and everybody should just do whatever and understand me. I just took it for granted that everybody should understand English, but, and that's not true. Uh, I think when you go somewhere, you have to try and speak a few things. You know, you have to at least try and greet people in their own language or make the effort and show they're making the effort. So that's one of the things that for me, it took a while to realize that um, people don't have to speak English. You know, you go to Hong Kong, you know, uh, and I was at uh, my ten was saying that you know people speak English. I actually I get in cabs in Hong Kong, and to this day, 
I might say Chong Kong Tower, Chong Kong Tower, Chong Kong Tower, and I cannot get to Chong Kong Tower, which is a huge office building that you know we can see from the Kowloon side. Um, so I'm starting there with little things. Now, when you go to business, that all you know translates so into business. If you show a little bit of willingness to accept the fact that somebody doesn't have to really uh, accept all ideas that you have just because you went to CLA, just because you think American, sound a little bit American. You know, um, w when you come down from that, let's say, level that uh, Americans in general put themselves on when they go somewhere, because they are big investors, they're big spenders, right? You start seeing a lot of acceptance. So, um, but that was hard for me because, you know, nobody was telling me that. I had to actually learn how to read the air, read the signs. Um, so cross-cultural differences, when you, when you think about uh, doing business in Hong Kong, um, I, I lived in, in Singapore and, you know, in Singapore, everybody had a really nice watch. So I was encouraged when I got like a really good bonus to go and buy me a really nice, shiny uh, Swiss watch. I had a good one, but it wasn't flamboyant enough. And the reason for that is because my, my local colleagues said, you know, if you're in Singapore dealing with the Chinese and you're wearing that watch that you're wearing, they're not going to think you're successful. Therefore, they're not going to want to deal with you. And in Hong Kong, it's the same. In Hong Kong, I have a lot of colleagues that have collections of watches because, you know, that's how they display their success. Now, you go to Japan and try and deal with the, the, the Japanese uh, banks, for example. They will look at your watch and say, wow, that's a really nice watch. It's a very expensive watch, isn't it? But that comment, I can now tell that, you know, it's a, it, it, they're speaking with disdain. They don't like that flamboyant uh, way that, you know, is so valued in Singapore and in Hong Kong and in China as well. Japan, uh, in Japan, you, you don't display wealth. You don't display, and it, you have to be a little more undertone. So understanding things like that, you know, it's not because it's Asia, we're all, all locations that we all want the same things, we all value the same things. And I think that to me is uh, one of the most uh, uh, important things that affects my, the way I do work uh, right now. And it's understanding that you know, what's valuable to, in some places is not valuable in other places. I deal a lot with Australia. And when I call them, I don't say, hey, how, how's it going? How are you doing? It's how are you going, mate? Because you know, you gotta actually get into the way they do things. So and it's little things like that, because they say, how are you going, mate? And I'd say, hey, you know, it's not how are you going, mate? How's it going or how are you doing? But you know, that's how they speak. And so that's how I speak too. And I realized that over time, you start getting included. When a lot of people say, you know, Australians are very, very cliquish. They can be. But every country, it's good for every country. You know, in Japan is the same. Singapore is the same. Um, so this diversity um, is something that you have to be aware of it all the time. And then you have the different ethnicities within each country. So if you go to Japan and you deal with Koreans, yeah, you know, my best friends in East LA were Koreans, but here it, Koreans uh, were and have been treated as second class citizens for a long time. But you know, it's, it's something that when, you, when you, you're, you're watching things happen, you know, people are born and raised in Japan, but they're not given Japanese citizenship, even though they only speak Japanese, you know. So these are, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but I'm saying that we have to be constantly uh, keep our antennas constantly up for these cultural uh, differences. You know, it's not just diversity in terms of gender. I mean, we're beyond that right now. Um, but every country deals with that differently. And I think one of the things that I learned uh, after a long time is if I go somewhere different, I say, you know, uh, is it okay for me to bring a gift to somebody? Is it okay to do this? Tell me the no-nos. Um, and every time I ask that question, I learn something new. So, um, anyway, it's a long answer to a, to a short question, but uh, it, it is a tough one, you know, this, the, the diversity and the cultural differences, cross-cultural differences.
Thank you so I'm much. I'm happy to expand on it later uh, <laughs> if anyone wants to hear more. Yes, if you have questions, please go to Sergio's room. And thank you for sharing that experience. It's very unique and we definitely could use that perspective. So my next question is for Jubing. So as somebody who's worked for the UN and works in sustainability, are there resources or opportunities that you wish you had taken advantage of during your time at UCLA? Thank you for the question. Uh, so first of all, UCLA is a huge university, which means you got lots of opportunities. You got a wide range of classes you won't see in a like, smaller university or a smaller um, liberal arts college. So definitely my first advice is to um, being really open-minded and explore those academic opportunities at UCLA. Before I came to UCLA, I do not know what is geography. I never been into a geography class before, but I attended geography class and I found my interest in sustainable development and international development very luckily, which helped me to choose my career later. And a second thing that you can take advantage of at UCLA is different um, student associations or different activities. I think there are like, is it 1,000 student association, uh, student organizations at UCLA, if I remember correctly, ranging from like cultural ones or academic ones, or just the ones that are having fun. Just go there and explore. And a third thing at UCLA, I think, because I major in global studies, so I'm part of the, I was part of the International Institute. The International Institute offer lots of opportunities to study abroad. I attend the study abroad project. Um, we went to um, New York, went to New York at the second year of my college. We studied the topic of international organizations. So every week we attend classes learning international law. And we also visited multiple international organizations like UN or Human Rights Watch. So that really gave me some opportunity to explore this field. And the fourth thing is to explore your alumni network. There are lots of UCLA alumni working in this field. We have a strong, um, I think, academic presence in the field of sustainability. There are lots of great faculty members. There are lots of great alumni. Don't be shy, reach out to them being open-minded. Thank you so much for that. Um, shifting to a different field, my next question is for Stanley. So there's a lot of Bruins who are interested in entrepreneurship, tech, and you're somebody who has experience with startups. Um, what advice would you give to Bruins who are interested in a career in entrepreneurship? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty, I would say, broad uh, question you raised there. Um, I think the concept of entrepreneurship probably um, can apply uh, across different domains. I think even if you are working within a large company, I think the notion of carrying an entrepreneur sort of hat exists. Um, but, you know, if you kind of look at more of the core uh, definition of entrepreneurship and sort of starting your own company, um, I think uh, earlier there's some some great comments from, from Tommy in terms of having that vision and conviction. So I think it all starts with passion, right? So that's the one thing that sustains throughout is really looking for uh, what, you know, you personally are convicted in terms of tr trying to, you know, bring to the market or solve, um, you know, in society or for a particular market opportunity. Um, uh, what I've learned kind of through the hard way was really going through uh, different sort of roles and different kind of companies where I was trying to find my own identity. Um, so I do sort of you know, find, you know, that it's awesome to hear from the other panelists where early on in their career, they know exactly sort of what sort of area they want to dive deep into, whether it's in social, whether it's in retail, whether it's in high tech, um, whether it's in nonprofit. Um, so once you kind of uh, sort of hang on to that bit, I think from there really is around building sort of the foundation 
to understand, um, you know, how to, again, sort of go through some of the basics of really running a business and an organization. Um, you know, you might come out from an art and, you know, from an art and science degree, you might come in from an engineering degree. I think in the beginning, it's important to ask a lot of questions um, and to, to network, uh, like many of the panelists have discussed, uh, to really just kind of round out sort of your view in terms of the different sort of domains that you may not be as comfortable with. It doesn't mean that you have to be an expert, you know, across finance and doesn't mean you have to be an expert in product management. Um, but you obviously want to uh, appreciate sort of those dimensions in terms of how you would actually be able to operate and scale out an organization or a business. And then finally, I know it's also kind of commonplace and a lot of folks talk about this, um, but the ability to take risks and to be able to fail uh, is something that a lot of us, I think, struggle with. I personally struggle with that a lot. Um, you know, where you want things to be perfect, you know, your say pitch deck, you know, you're staring at it for hours and you're changing the fonts and changing the colors and you, you know, is this the right word? Um, so you're worried about things like that. You're worried about, okay, how am I going to start this? I only have $5,000 to kind of get this thing off the ground, or maybe, you know, you have a little bit more, uh, but you're always worried about not being able to see the next thing. Um, so I think it's important, again, to kind of stay convicted, but also, again, be vulnerable and try. Um, there's no fault in trying. And, you know, as they say, if you, if you don't even give it a shot, you know, that you're kind of still at kind of step zero. Um, and so that's, you know, something else that I think I've learned personally in terms of uh, having been with startups, but also working with other startups in the community in the U.S. and in Asia, uh, the ones that actually have done well. Um, more often than not, uh, the individuals have failed um, multiple times. Uh, they learn the hard way, they pick themselves back up, and then they iterate and they keep going. So um, just obviously some high level sort of tips and advice from that point of view. Hope that helps, Kat. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, we actually have another panelist who had to join us a little late, but we're so happy to have her here. Um, so, Kara, could you introduce yourself? And then I think we'll have a question for you afterwards. For sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kara. I study psychology and Egyptology in uh, UCLA, and I graduated in 2016. Um, I actually moved to Japan uh, right after I graduated, so uh, very happy to meet uh, Kali and also Sergio, who also live in Japan. Um, uh, definitely, UCLA is a great community to be in, um, and like you just won't see how many opportunities you really see after, after um, un until you meet the alumni around the world. So I actually found myself in the UX field uh after five years at five years after graduating from UCLA and somehow just like stumble upon the fintech field um I'm very happy to be in the UX field because I find it really um associated with my psychology degree so if you're interested in the tech field definitely um excited to talk to you that's awesome Kara um so our question for you is and you kind of touched upon it a little but how and to what extent do you think that major affects career path and career development? And is there a career plan that you actually had during undergrad? Um, and how is it, is it different from what you're currently pursuing? It's very different. So like I said, I studied psychology. So I was actually planning to be a psychologist after um, graduating, but then, you know, I went to Japan, I taught English for two years, and then I was, I was also writing freelance on, uh, 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 on the side. So that kind of kickstart my writing career. Um, but then I also studied psychology um, and I was very excited uh, in the tech scene, which is how I got into UX um, at the end. But then honestly, like what you study can be completely different from what you're doing. Uh, for your career. I know a lot of people who, you know, they were pre-med in college, but then they took a big boot camp and they're they're software engineers now. So your yeah, your life can really go in so many different directions. Um, and yeah, it's exciting. That's so great to hear. Okay, so we have a little bit of time left for everyone um, before we start networking, which everyone's very excited about. So I just want to do a quick speed round from everyone. Um, 
if you could all just say one really short last piece of advice that you would have for the rest of us Bruins. And any of you can start, or if not, I can call on people. Uh, I'll start. Thank you. Okay, so one thing is uh, every time somebody says, hey, volunteer, anybody has any questions, I'd always keep my head down, my, my hands down too. But that's one of the things that I'd say you should always do. If, you know, somebody asks you, raise your hand because, you know, that willingness goes a long way. But the, the one thing I wanted to share was uh, a lot of people, um, and I see the tone of the messages when they're sent to me because I'm a dinosaur, right? I think young people should not be afraid of uh, reaching out to older people. And uh, I, I do a number of things like this, you know, like a mentorship and stuff. My advice is, my piece of advice here is, you know, just feel free to uh, reach out to older people, to alumni or one specific alumnus that you have interest in, because I think older people and alumni in general like to help younger people. So don't be afraid, right? Uh, the worst that you can get is a no, I can't help you. But you know, a no doesn't hurt, right? I know that now, yeah. I agree. I'll, I'll just add that, um, you know, all of us have different personality types and not everyone is into being, um, assertive and, and going out there and meeting new people. Um, but I think uh, there is there are extensive networks out there for you to tap, particularly within the UCLA community. And if you don't like the term networking or if you don't like this idea of just like latching on to people, um, think of it as just learning about new fields and uh, new directions and uh, exploring new options. Um, and I think that it, it can inspire you to, to find your identity or to go down your eventual path. So uh, always just, uh, you know, try to reach out and uh, make new friends and learn from other people. Um, and, you know, it, even if you're not the most uh, out, outwardly going, um, I think, especially with email, and uh, other types of social media, LinkedIn, et cetera, uh, it, it's becoming a lot easier because I remember when I was younger, I hated going to networking events, but through Zoom and stuff, it's, it's a lot easier. So I think you should definitely take advantage of that. Awesome. Uh, Yifei, I think I saw your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to um, say some things, but um, I want to make sure other people get a chance first. Um, but since you, you mentioned me, I'll just go now. Um, I think the one thing I would say is UCLA um, does an incredible job of preparing us academically and in theory. Um, I would say better than most of the majority of the schools that rank higher than UCLA. Um, however, I think where UCLA falls short is preparing us to have the vision and passion necessarily to um, pursue a certain job or field after graduating. And I think that's where students have to take it upon themselves to find mentorship. And I think at least when I was at UCLA, the best source of mentorship was uh, the fellowship programs. And I think all students should check out the fellowship programs. Um, speaking uh, for the people in the economics uh, major, the best fellowships are the Sharp Fellows. And I believe there's a new one that's like um, in the value investing program. But uh, those are fantastic because essentially all my friends who are in it basically got their jobs and got great mentors out of these programs. So I would really recommend at least checking those programs out, especially if you're younger because most of them, I think you actually need some time to prepare for. So check them out and try, try to get into them. Thank you so much. Um, just as a follow up, um, would you, could you elaborate on um, 
say like your experience applying for jobs? Um, do you have any advice for international Bruins who are applying for those kinds of things right now? Uh, yes, but um, there's so much nuance. If you're asking for like an international student applying for an, a job in America specifically, I can give like some perspectives for that. Or if it's like an American student applying for a international job, that's completely different. Um, which one should I maybe dive into a little bit? Um, I think whichever one you feel most comfortable like with your experience sharing. Okay. Um, I think for international students getting a job in America, I think it's still a must. I think globally, whether you stay in America or return to your country or go somewhere else, uh, work experience in America is still the golden standard globally unless you can get into like a big four company or like a, a McKenzie, Bain, BCG kind of level or like Fortune 100 companies in other countries. Otherwise, get a job in America. That would mean more for your future. However, do know that the H-1B is a golden handcuff. Um, and the reason why I say that is you're not allowed to switch jobs or really take vacations if you have an H-1B. Because as soon as you leave the country, there's a chance, especially during the Trump era, there's a chance you weren't coming back in. Um, so that was an issue. And um, I would say if you want to stay in America, start applying for a green card early because it does take a long time. And uh, the H-1B um, does help you with that. But if you're Canadian or if you have like a, a your country has a special trade agreement with America, um, check that because sometimes those uh, special visas don't allow you to get a green card. So just be careful of that. And um, luckily, econ is now a STEM degree. If you're an econ major, you're lucky. Um, so yeah, I think that's a bit, that's all I have for now. Hopefully that's helpful. No, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and for being here. Again, thank you to everyone for being here. Um, we actually have another um, panelist who couldn't join us earlier, but we're glad to have them here now. So uh, Talia, if you could introduce yourself and then afterwards I can ask you a question and then we'll soon go back, go into breakout rooms and everybody can start really getting to know each other. Sure, hi everybody. Um, sorry I was late, got caught up in work today. But I'm Talia, I just graduated last year from UCLA uh, with a degree in economics. Um, I am originally from Dubai um, and I was an SAA, so they're putting on this event, which is like great, so I'm happy to be back. And right now I am a financial analyst at Intel. Um, I did my internship there about two years ago now in 2019, and then I took a full-time offer back. So that's what I'm doing right now. Awesome. So we do have a question prepared for you. Um, as someone who graduated very recently in 2020 and applied for jobs during the pandemic, what advice would you have for students who are in the same position that you were one year ago? Right, so I actually didn't apply to jobs during the pandemic, so I got really lucky that way because I did my internship right before that. So I had a full-time offer in hand, but I would say if, if I was someone that was like applying to jobs during the pandemic, I would say, you know, networking is like probably the most important thing. I have friends who are doing it right now that just graduated last year. And I, a lot of them have gotten interview opportunities by just reaching out to people on LinkedIn, right? So you see someone from UCLA or you see someone in a company that you're interested in, reach out to them, get an informational interview. Those things go a long way. Um, and that would be my piece of advice. Just network, reach out to people. You might not get a job through it, but I feel like there's just so much learning you can do. Awesome, thank you so much. And networking is what we're all here to do. So thank you to our panelists.